Hello, Holton Elementary students. This is Christopher Mick, otherwise known as the Space Guy. I am here to do a STEAM program for you on a new rover on Mars. So you have to forgive me. You're probably saying, Space Guy, we've gotten a ton of Mars. Please, no more Mars. But this has been a really big deal, and there's been some amazing images that have gotten downloaded uh, in just the last day or so. So I am recording this on Monday the 9th. Just for clarification, if some big news breaks uh, after that, I'm recording this on Monday the 9th, but let's get into it. So again, my name is Christopher Mick. I uh, run a STEAM educational nonprofit here called Space St. Croix, and I do some amazing uh, things. As you see pictured here, uh, off on this side, I am at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, where the gentleman behind me is prepping some materials to be sent up to the International Space Station, a uh, outside telescope that was gonna be hooked to the outside of the space station. And then here I'm interviewing astronaut Scott Kelly uh, after his year long mission on the International Space Station. And they get to do a lot of cool programs like this at the Hudson Area Library uh, for students. This is the end of my interview with Scott Kelly where the uh, photographer there was kind enough to take a picture and you can see all his cool mission patches from his year long stay there. And then this kind of ties in what we're talking about today. This is me holding a uh, Curiosity model rover wheel. So there are six of these, and the Curiosity and the new Perseverance rovers are very similar. The wheels are a little bit different. I'll show that later on the new one, but this is just to give you a sense of how big the wheels are. There are six of these, three on each side of the rovers, and they're made out of aluminum. They're not that heavy. Uh, they're kind of built like a snowshoe to uh, keep the rovers from sinking down into anything. If you've ever seen any photos of snowshoes or you've gotten to do that, that's why snowshoes work well. Uh, on the ice and snow if it's uh, kind of deep because it spreads out the weight of you uh, across the surface area of the snowshoe and so you don't sink down into the snow and that's the same concept why the tires look the way they do. And let's get into it. Oh, and yes, it's uh, Women's History Month and I wanted to give a shout out to, this is uh, Dr. Mae Jemison and here she is seen pictured on board her uh, space shuttle mission. This is in the space lab which is a laboratory located in the back of the space shuttle when they flew it up on special missions. And this is a couple of years ago where I got to meet Dr. J. She was the commencement speaker at a college graduation. So I wanted to give a shout out to her. And then I also work as a NASA solar system ambassador and that's managed out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And if you've ever gone to Disneyland, uh, JPL is about 15 minutes or so from Disneyland out in California. And so uh, all month is Women's History Month, but yesterday on Monday happened to be International Women's Day. And so JPL uh, sent out this slide picturing all the women that work uh, at JPL. So it's pretty amazing. And, uh, and I think I have one last slide, yes. And then uh, these three ladies were featured on a great, um, what do you call it? Not like really a podcast, but they kind of did a presentation uh, on their careers uh, in STEM. And these three ladies are uh, key people that worked on the Mars uh, Ingenuity helicopter, which is seen in artwork here. This is hopefully what will be happening um, either later, the end of this month or early next month. This is the Perseverance rover and it's got a helicopter brought with, brought with it. And this will be uh, hopefully what the scene will be like when they do the first helicopter flight. So these three ladies are integral uh, to the engineering team for the helicopter. And um, if any of you young ladies out there would be interested in seeing this program, I'd be happy to send along the link. It's been recorded. It was live last night. Uh, and they just talk about uh, what they studied in school and what they're interested in and how they kind of found a way to uh, working at NASA. So if any of you would be interested in seeing that, I'd be happy to forward that along. And now to what we're talking about. So everything here on this side, if you can see my cursor dancing around, is the uh, kind of sequence of events that happened for the Perseverance rover to land safely on the surface. So hopefully you have those posters. Uh, I think I distributed one for the classroom to Mr. Rock there. So you uh, have an art, artist depiction of what the rover looks like on Mars now. And uh, I gave that for a couple reasons. I'll explain later, but you can go up and take a look at kind of closer detail things in the rover. And these are all the things that had to happen for it to land safely. And I illustrate this for a couple of reasons because um, Mars is so far away from us here on Earth that even when it's at its closest, where each planet is as close as they get to each other in their respective orbits, it takes uh, communications at the speed of light about three, three and a half minutes 
to get from sending a message from the Earth to the rover, and then it would be another three and a half minutes back. And right now, Mars and Earth are further apart than that, so it's more on the order of about uh, around five, uh, five minutes uh, one way. So the rover had to be specially programmed with uh, an artificial intelligence and a, a special navigation computer uh, built on board that would allow it to make all these uh, decisions and execute all these commands in a set sequence, a set order for everything to happen successfully. So this first picture is what the uh, rover looked like for about its most of its seventh month. Uh, it took seven months from when it was launched at the end of July at Kennedy Space Center in Florida all the way until it landed uh, just last month. It landed on February 18th. So most of the mission, it's in what's called this cruise stage. It's got a solar panel on the back that's always pointed toward the sun. And the rover is in this little kind of gumdrop shaped shell uh, protected. And it's just cruising its way to Mars. When it gets there, it detaches from that solar panel. And so it's just the heat shield and the rover packed inside. So it drops this cruise stage part and then it hits the atmosphere and it needs that heat shield pointed that direction because it gets up over 2000 degrees then it hits the atmosphere, which would uh, burn up anything that we would be sending to Mars if it did not have that protective heat shield. So after it gets through the thick part of the atmosphere and the heat is no longer a problem, it jettisons that heat shield and it deploys a parachute. So the parachute starts to slow it down. And now that the heat shield's gone, the radar can start scanning the ground and seeing if its map that it has preloaded is matching what it's seeing on the ground. If it's seeing different things than what it thinks it should based on the map it has, it can deviate to try to get to a safer landing spot. And uh, the parachute works really well, but Mars's atmosphere is a hundred times thinner than our atmosphere on Earth. And so that means if any of you've seen video of a skydiver, you know, someone jumping out of an airplane with a parachute, when they open that parachute, it slows them down enough to where they can come in for a nice safe landing standing up. On Mars, uh, when the parachute deploys, it slows the rover down, but it's still going 200 miles an hour, which is way faster than we'd want to come down and hit uh, the surface of Mars. That would be a big car wreck if we hit that fast. So there has to be another element. So when it scanned the ground and it knows where it wants to come into land, it engages these rockets, if you can see them, that are on the four corners around the rover. And it comes in to hover over the landing site. And then it does this crazy maneuver that I have a bigger picture of, so it's easier to see, which is called the sky crane maneuver. Because it's kind of dangerous just to come in all the way for landing on the rockets, because as the rockets get closer to the ground, they're really strong and they're gonna knock up rocks and dust and these rocks could slam in and break the rover and cause a lot of damage to the computers and the science experiments. So they needed to figure out a way to not come in all the way for landing on the rockets. So this sky crane maneuver was developed. And the engineer said, well, maybe we could come down to where we want to land and hover there. And then we could lower the rover on these three cables. And when the rover makes contact with the ground, it has a contact sensor. And that sensor says, I'm safely on the ground. And then there's an instrument called a guillotine, which is a very sharp knife and it's triggered and it slams through all these metal cords, it cuts them. And then the uh, sky crane is directed to use its remaining fuel, just a little bit of fuel left and to fly far away and crash. So it doesn't keep coming down and landing on top of the rover. And then you have a rover safely on the ground. Now this is referred to as the seven minutes of terror, everything I described to you, which is shown in a little short video because when the rover first hits the atmosphere until all that happens and it lands on the ground is seven minutes. And there's nothing we can do on earth to help it or tell it which way to go. It all has to happen with the kind of smarts on board the computer there for the rover. And then we will see if it's safely landed. And as we all now know, it did uh, successful landing. So this is what perseverance looks like when it's all deployed. And this is what's been happening since it landed on the 18th of February. It's inspected itself. It took photos of all the wheels and all the science experiments to make sure nothing's damaged. It turns on instruments to make sure they're working properly. It extended and tested its arm that that can deploy. The mast was uh, laid in the flat position, popped up. 
the weather sensors extended. So all these things have been kind of happening uh, for the last few days. And we'll talk more about some of the parts of the rover, but I just want to show you, this is what it's going to look like when it's kind of ready for action and out driving around and exploring Mars. These were amazing shots. No one has ever seen these before. They put cameras, if anybody's seen, uh, like when there's videos of skiers or skateboarders doing things and that you see the video of it, they're wearing like a little digital camera on their helmet, like a GoPro or whatnot. That's what these are. NASA just purchased little off the shelf uh, GoPro cameras and mounted them on several places on the rover. So if it worked, we'd be able to see recordings of the parachute deploying and the landing happening. So this is the parachute. We'll talk more about why it's painted this way later, but that's the parachute deploying on Mars, uh, slowing the rover down. So this is taken from the top of the aero shell and facing up uh, toward the parachutes. So you see the parachute deploy, and then this is when it's coming in for a landing. So this is from the top of the rover pointing up at that sky crane. So this is the sky crane bringing it in for a landing. This is the Martian sky you see above. And you're not seeing any uh, rocket thrust come out of these just because the chemicals they're using are invisible in the atmosphere. It is spraying thrust. If you held your hand out there, you would feel the heat and, uh, and the, the force of it, it's just not visible to the naked eye because of the chemicals they're using. So it's being lowered on these cables. And this is the data cable that's allowing us to see the video. And then this next shot, this is from the sky crane now that you just saw facing down. So you're seeing those same three cables that are holding the rover and then that data cable that's allowing the video to be recorded. And now you can see all the dust swirling on Mars. It's just before the wheels are touching the ground. And uh, it's right before contact. So just amazing to see this happen uh, as it was, was lowering to the surface. And then this is a hard one to see, but I wanted to show you. This is the sky crane. You can see maybe one of the frayed cables here. This is right after the cables have been cut. And so the sky crane is flying away and it's gonna go out of the shot. This is from the rover's perspective looking up and the sky crane is just about to fly out of the frame. And then this is one of the small, they call them a hazard camera. There are little cameras in the bottom of the rover to constantly take photographs when it's driving of any nearby rocks or things they want to look out for. So the sky crane flew away and it crashed. And this is a photo the rover caught of the crash. If you can see this little cloud of smoke up here and the dust, that's from the sky crane crashing into the ground. This is about a mile away. And the rover actually caught a photograph of that, which is just amazing. And then this is when the rover uh, was safely landed and took one of its first pictures of Mars. So you see the, uh, the surface is curved. That's because it has, if you've heard of a fisheye lens, you may have played with an app that kind of does that. A fisheye lens is just a very small lens and it's curved to get the widest possible view from one camera lens. And so this is one of those hazard cameras down by the wheels. You can see a shadow of the wheel and the shadow of the rover. So we know the sun is behind us. And this is the Martian surface where it landed. Um, and those hazard cameras or those fisheye lenses so we can see as much as we can in the one camera shot. And then it starts going around doing like a safety check of all the systems like I talked about. So this is one of the hazard cameras just of the wheels to see if the wheels are okay. And you can see the Martian landscape, some interesting rocks with all the holes there uh, where we landed in Jezero Crater. And then this, uh, another amazing thing that happened, we have several satellites that are orbiting Mars all the time. And so they timed the landing that uh, one of these spacecraft would be flying over a landing site as soon as it came in for a landing. So this photo is from a spacecraft called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it's just like a weather satellite that would, you'd see orbiting Earth. But it took a photograph and these are all the key areas. So this is where Perseverance landed. And then this is the uh, descent stage that I showed you in that previous photo where it flew off and crashed in that puff of smoke. And then this is where the parachute and the uh, back shell where that, that photograph, the camera that took that picture of the parachute is right over here now, because it was on top of that aero shell, so that landed over here. And then the heat shield, which was the first thing to deploy, that uh, landed over here. So it's about where all the engineers expected everything. They wanted everything to fall away clear enough from the rover. These distances are all, this is about a mile, mile and a half, uh, to the heat shield about a mile and a third to the back shell. So everything's uh, roughly a mile or so away from where Perseverance landed. 
And then further inspections, this is the arm. It's about a nine foot uh, arm that has a drill on it. So it's got perseverance written on it and everything's checking out. So all the instruments are in good shape. The rover's in very good shape. And then I wanted to show this. Uh, some people ask me, they think when you fly a mission to a planet, you can just kind of go in a straight line. And I always kind of laugh because uh, actually all the trajectories kind of look like a banana, if you can follow me here. So this is when it took off from Earth. And if you follow this white line, and then this is when it just arrived at Mars last month. So doesn't that look like a banana? Kind of on side. So that's the way you need to fly to Mars. About every two years, 26 months to be precise, Earth and Mars get where they're as close as they're ever going to get to each other in orbit. And that's, that's why all these missions are launched in the summer, this past summer, because this is that alignment that happens just over every two years. So um, the Chinese launched a spacecraft to Mars, the United Arab Emirates launched a spacecraft to Mars, and then we launched our uh, Perseverance rover. So they all took off in the summer and they all arrived um, about the same time within a week or so of each other uh, in February. So the reason that happens is, I don't wanna get in the crazy math, but there's, you can go to Mars whenever you want to, obviously, but there's a high energy way to get there and a low energy. And engineers always like a low energy. Low energy means you need less fuel to get there. You don't need to use such a big rocket and you can take a heavier thing to get there. So the Perseverance rover is very heavy. It weighs over 2000 pounds. It's about the size of a small car like an SUV. So they want to always launch when the arrangement's like this. And the best way I can explain the orbits, if any of you have gotten to do like a track and field day at EP Rock or at the high school where there's that nice big oval running track, picture Mars being the outside most lane and Earth being the inside most lane and the sun being in the center of the grassy football field. So the Earth is always going to make a quicker loop around the track than Mars. It's gonna take longer for Mars to get around. So that's what we have here. Earth orbits the sun once every 365 days. Mars does the same thing in orbit of the sun, but it takes about two Earth years for it to get around. So it's uh, further out and it takes longer to make its orbit. And so this is the best way to get to Mars. So when it took off, we were here. And then when it landed last month, you can see we're getting kind of out of uh, closeness again. So this is where Earth is when the rover landed. So that's why that light travel time is getting longer. It's in that four, four and a half minute range for uh, to send messages back and forth. And then this is another chart I wanted to show because um, when we get as close as we get, we're 36 million miles away that I showed you in that orbit, and we get as far from Mars as we get in the orbit, depending on how we're arranged, 250 million miles away. And so that light time communication can be three minutes to send a message to Mars, or it can take 21 minutes to send a mes message to Mars. And then you have to wait 21 minutes to get the reply back or the picture back that you want. So all the computer commands really have to be well thought out and transmitted uh, in advance because it's going to take quite a while to get back and then one trivia thing for you to know there is a time when we are both orbiting the sun where we are on the opposite side of the sun from mars and we can't send radio signals through the sun so we have to wait there's a time when we get blocked out we cannot hear or send any signals to the rover so preparing for that we send signals for the uh the rover what the rover should work on and that will reply back after uh, Mars has cleared the sun's orbit and we can see direct line of sight communications again. So that's a little factoid for you. And there are times when we cannot talk to the rover no matter what. And then just recently, this is from yesterday, uh, did a small drive. So these are the hazard cameras, again, kind of looking at the tire tracks that they made in the Martian dirt. And then this is a size comparison for you on the rovers we've sent so far. So the very first rover we ever sent was called Sojourner, kind of the size of a big dog. And that was in 1996. And then we sent uh, Spirit and Opportunity, two rovers, they're twin rovers. So only one is pictured here, but they both landed successfully on Mars. A uh, taller rover, both of these were solar powered. And uh, then we got up to the Curiosity rover, which is pictured here. So again, the size of like a small car. And then Perseverance looks a lot like Curiosity. It's the same kind of six wheeled, big car sized rover, but it has all different kind of science instruments and a different type of drill 
uh, and things on the rover. So if you looked at them far away, you'd say, oh, that's kind of the same rover. But when you get up closer, you can see that they are different with the science uh, that's on board them. And then this is what uh, Perseverance will be looking like really soon here. So now it's driving around, all its systems check out. It's got this amazing drill on it that can drill into rock and capture like a sidewalk chalk size piece of rock. And it's going to uh, put those in little sample return capsules. It's got 40 little sample return capsules on board and it can store those chalk sized pieces of rock that it finds interesting that we might wanna study back on earth and there's going to be a future mission that's going to collect all those rock samples and fly them back to Earth. So these are all the different countries that submitted uh, science experiments that are on board the rover. And one interesting thing it has, I'm not going to be able to talk about all these because we have to keep moving through, but MOXIE, this one right here, is anticipation of astronauts arriving to Mars because it's going to do an experiment to make oxygen out of the atmosphere there. It's a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. We can't breathe carbon dioxide. But there is a way to pull an oxygen atom out of carbon dioxide and just collect that and keep making oxygen atoms, kind of splitting them apart. So if that works the way we think it will, it's going to prove it on this mission. That could be something where when we're getting ready to send astronauts, we would send machines in advance to land on Mars and their job would be just to sit there and make oxygen. And the reason that's really important, because then when astronauts go, they wouldn't have to bring as much oxygen for breathing and they wouldn't have to make, uh, bring as much rocket fuel for the return trip because when you make oxygen on Mars, not only can you use it for breathing air when the astronauts get there for their habitat that they're living in, but it's also a main component in rocket fuel, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, uh, liquid methane. And so that would save a whole lot of weight because then the astronauts can safely know that they had tons of oxygen waiting for them when they get to Mars for the return trip. And then there's some Easter eggs on the rover. So again, as the rover was taking pictures, checking out that everything's okay, uh, what's highlighted here in this red box is kind of hard to see, but it's blown up and shown on its side here for it. And if you can make out, it showed the family tree of all the rovers. Perseverance is the fifth rover to land on Mars. And there's a better picture here. So this is that plate. So you see, uh, the history of the five rovers like we kind of showed and then the Ingenuity helicopter that it has with it. These are just mission patches that we have here on Earth. And then this plate is on the rover too, which kind of ties into why I can't be there to speak with you today because this plate was to honor all the medical workers that were keeping everybody safe while they're working at NASA to keep the rover on schedule to launch. So it's kind of uh, recognizing the medical workers uh, keeping us safe through the COVID-19 situation and that we were able to persevere uh, and get the mission launched and we're all persevering and making it through the school year. And that's affixed to the outside of the rover uh, as well. And then Perseverance, this is why I'm excited on this because it's the first part in like a three-part mission because uh, in 2026, we're gonna start the Mars sample return mission. And it could be later than 2026, that's the target date. It could get moved to 2028, but we're hoping it's 2026. But Perseverance is gonna collect all these sample tubes I talked about. This is what they'll look like when the rover drops them off. And there could be up to 40 of these collected. We are gonna send a lander that has solar panels for power. It's gonna extend this ramp in this little fetch rover, whoops, much smaller than Perseverance. It's gonna be kind of a little bit smaller than even like Opportunity and Spirit little tiny rover. Uh, it's just going to have a camera for seeing and an uh, arm to pick up these sample tubes and store them. It'll drive around and collect all the sample tubes, go back, drive up the ramp, park where it came out of, and then there's an arm that's going to take all the sample return tubes and put them in this rocket. And this rocket will um, then take off from the surface of Mars, go into orbit around Mars, and then a third spacecraft is being built by the European Space Agency. They're helping us. And Mars and Earth are not this close together. This is just an artist thing to show you that it's now leaving, it's collected the sample in Mars orbit, which is pictured up here. And now it's flying its way back to Earth. And then this capsule will be um, jettisoned from the satellite and will use its heat shield and parachute to safely land back on the Earth in one of our first Mars samples that anybody's ever seen and able to study and learn more about. If there was any microbes or bacteria or fossils 
uh, that might have lived back in Mars ancient past. Because where the rover landed is the, the site of an ancient um, lake bed. And we know there used to be flowing water in there. You can see the kind of dry river valley there. And so on Earth, sometimes we find fossils there of old microbes and bacteria that lived on Earth. We're thinking if the conditions were right, maybe we will find fossils there on Mars. And then the big exciting one coming up, I think the end of the month or early next month will be the, the uh, test first test flight of the helicopter. So this is the Ingenuity helicopter. And a helicopter can work on Mars. We've never flown a helicopter anywhere than the Earth. But this is a, a proof of concept to see if we can really do this. So it's got a little solar panel on top to charge after its flights. These two big carbon fiber, very strong, very lightweight. If anybody plays tennis, uh, carbon fiber rackets are the really good lightweight tennis rackets where they're impossible to break and really strong. So that's what the blades are made out of. And as I talked before, that the Mars atmosphere is 100 times thinner than Earth's. So if this was flying on Earth, as some of you may have flown drones, you could have very small little blades and it would work. But because the atmosphere is so thin, we have to make strong, much longer blades. And there's two blades and they counter rotate, which means they each go an opposite direction. And that's just to help keep stability for the rover. If each blade's going in an opposite direction, it's not gonna be torqued or pulled one way or the other. It should keep it very stable and safe. So it's got some sensors and cameras on it. It's gonna do hopefully four or five short test flights. And when it gets to it's, right now it's stored in a, a container on the bottom of the rover. So when the rover finds a good location for it, it's gonna deploy it and then it'll look like this. It'll be on the ground and the rover will back away. And then they'll do a test flight and then the rover's cameras will film it, kind of like make a movie of the, the takeoff and landing and how it does. So the cameras on the rover will photograph the helicopter and then the helicopter has its own cameras that'll photograph the ground uh, and see how it does. So if this works, future missions could have larger helicopters and when astronauts go, there could be drones deployed to go explore and scout out where the most interesting areas might be to go find ice or go find things that the astronauts are looking for. And then these are those wheels, the difference, like I told you, if you remember the picture I showed, different tread, they're thin, not as wide, they're taller. So that's the uh, kind of evolution of the tires because the old tires that are on Curiosity, the Curiosity rover is still driving on Mars. It's been there since 2012, but we've noticed, and when we take camera shots, the wheels, it's starting to get holes punched in the wheels from the sharp rocks. So we thought this wheel design might make a safer, longer lasting tire because we're learning after each mission. And so that's the latest for the tires. And then this is a picture from yesterday. So this is amazing because they just released this. This is the uh, candidate site for dropping off the helicopter. So you can see it's nice and flat and level. They didn't want any rocks or obstructions around. So the engineers are reviewing this as we speak. Uh, this is a candidate for dropping off the helicopter. And if the engineers agree this is a good spot, this is where they will set the helicopter down. If there's any objectionable issue, they will go scout out another uh, site for dropping off the helicopter. But this could be it. What you're looking at right now might be the decision on where they drop off the helicopter, right, right here. Uh, so it's kind of exciting to see where that might actually be happening. But this literally just got downloaded uh, yesterday. And then this amazes me, you may say, <clears throat> space guy, I don't get why you're excited about some dirt in a rock. <clears throat> but this is the amazing camera system. Uh, it has zoom lenses for the first time. So if you walk up to that poster that Mr. Rock has uh, hopefully out or hanging on the wall, if you look at the lenses there, there's two square lenses that kind of represent the distance of our eyes. You'll see little square lenses to the left and right. That allows for... Uh, stereoscopic 3D and zoom images. So this image is from where the rover landed. It hadn't driven yet. This is about a mile away. And it took this amazing picture for the detail. And this is that crater we're in. So you can see the walls back here. We are in this crater. And this is that evidence of water being there. You see these rounded rocks and all the sediment. This was built up by churning water. And these rocks were rounded by churning water. So it's just amazing to see an area that you know is flooded this entire area at one time in Mars history was underwater. You can see that with all these rocks and this image just blows me away. I was just staring at it for an hour. I'm like, I can't believe the rover's there. So uh, 
And then this is a sunset that it recorded on Mars. This is what the sun looks like from Mars, from the rover's perspective. So you can see the hills there uh, of the crater in the distance and the sun going down. So a little bit like Earth. So that is all the slides I have for you. Um, I will stop sharing here. And there we are. So uh, I hope you're having a great week. I know you're going to be watching the movie uh, Hidden Figures. I've got my Katherine Johnson uh, Barbie doll from Hidden Figures there. So uh, I hope you enjoy uh, the movie for that. Oh, and I was going to show one other thing. I have um, in the size comparison, this is a globe I have from an astronomer in England. So this is the Earth. And then this is Mars at the same scale. So some people think uh, the Earth and Mars are much closer in size, but it's a lot smaller. So that's why, why you'd only weigh about a third of how much you weigh here on Earth, you'd weigh on Mars. And then for comparison, even going further, this is the size of our moon compared to Mars. So on the moon, like Neil Armstrong, if you weighed 120 pounds on Earth, you only weigh 20 pounds. On the moon, you weigh one sixth. So um, you can kind of see the size difference here. So when you're doing your planet reports, the larger the planet or the object, like the sun has more gravity than anything in the solar system because it's the largest. And when you get to planets, it's Jupiter. So the larger the object, the more gravity. So when you go to these smaller objects, we would weigh less than we do. So there's a calculator you have from one of your activities where you can type in your weight and it'll tell you what you weigh on whatever planet. And uh, then I've got my models of the rovers here. So we've got two of these. So if I was able to pass these around for you, so this is the uh, Curiosity rover and this is Opportunity now with that drill deploys. They look very similar. As you can see, they're both driving around doing science. And uh, it's kind of amazing that uh, we've got those rovers happening right there. And then the, uh, the landing site was really cool because if you can see this, this is that Jezero crater, it's false colors. You can see the kind of minerals and deposits there. But if you see that black circle I drew, that was the landing site, the landing area that the engineers were hoping for. And if you see that black circle, that is where Perseverance actually landed. So they almost hit a dead center in the circle which just blows me away because it's 300 million miles away. It traveled and it almost it was like one mile off of where they wanted to land. So pretty amazing. So I hope you have a great week. I hope you learned a little something on that. And I hope I get to see you guys in person next year. Oh, and I'm being reminded by my son. So these are the, uh, the logos you saw in some of those patches. So this was for um, entry, descent and landing. So you can see the date on there parachutes and coming in on February 18th and then the uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance with the rover and that's the helicopter pictured there so uh, exciting times as you can tell and I hope you enjoy the handouts and for that and uh, thank you so much for letting me talk with you so we'll see you guys later thanks